A Tale of Dire Occult Evil The Edge of the Shadow By R. Ernest Depew That you should believe this would be remarkable. I have no explanation. Limited knowledge I have, and hearsay for the rest. The hearsay at first I did not believe. But when the man who lifted the curtain had gone west, and he was the hard-headed soldier man, I wondered. For his going, when one takes everything into consideration, fitted in. And to that at least I can bear witness. We were lying in our dugout in Remain, waiting for zero hour. Outside, Fritz's counter-preparation was messing things up considerably. Through an instant's lull came the long-drawn howl of a dog if it was a dog, and something scratched and slithered into the sturdy logs of our shelter. A spray of shrapnel, perhaps. "'It's calling me,' was all that he said. I can see his face and the quizzical lift of his eyebrows in the glare of our gasoline lanterns. We were motorized artillery and did things in style. And as I returned his stare, his yarn, forgotten for two years, came back. He had to go out a few minutes later to check up data at the guns, and when we found him in the daunting, a splinter, or something, had ripped away his throat. Nothing else. But even now, when a dog gives dismal tongue to the quiet of night, I feel my hackles rise, and the ice creep up my backbone, and I wonder. It was a book that had made him open up to me in the first place. A book called Dracula. Ever read it? No? Well, sometime, when you want a good crawly chill, look it over. He had noticed it on a shelf one night, when he had dropped in at my quarters for a chat, sometime before we went into the war. And he asked me what I thought of it. He didn't pay much attention to my opinion, I guess, but sat there sucking his pipe and nodding while I talked. And then he said, I scraped against the edge of that stuff, just the edge. Not, it's not so good. Now he wasn't at all the type of man that one would link up with that sort of yarn. And for that reason, it made all the more impression on me. He didn't attempt any explanation, either, just told it as it struck him. And do not get the idea that he was boasting of his conquest. I didn't know the girl, never would know her, and we had been friends too long for him to fear that I might blab. His thoughts had just come to a boil, I imagine, looking at the book and bringing back the thing, so he had to get it out of his system. It seems that he had met her in a casual way, but first glance had been like the fire in tow. Headlong they went into it, with open eyes, a well-matched pair. She must have been a wonder, a Russian with all the Slavic grasp of the Ar Zamande, one moment all fire and passion, and the next an iceberg, a thoroughbred, too. Gone wrong, if you will, but always a thoroughbred. And he was my friend. Not that he elaborated on their adventure. I simply filled in, in my mind's eye, the brief, bold outline he blocked out. The climax came one night when they were riding. They had had several nocturnal prowls on horseback, I gathered. Brief intervals of dalliance. This night they took a trail that was new to both. Imagine them jogging side by side, the August moon rising over the treetops, throwing the mass of foliage into deep relief, great blocks of velvet blackness against the cloudless sky. Above them, fields shining silver in the moonlight. The shadows swallowed them up as the trail twisted into the woods the man leading, 
his white-shirted back gleaming vaguely to the woman following close, the horses picking their way uphill and down. Through the brush and trees the trail ran, now sloping upward, on hillsides whose inky depths defied the faint moonlight, now plunging in woodland pockets. I could feel the gloom that closed them in as he talked, a tangible thing, seemingly, ever surrounding, yet ever giving way before their advance, until at last they broke through to a moonlit plateau, and cantered together over the swelling ridges to draw rain on the very crest of the cliff. Below them the lowlands spread in tawny languor, till they touched the silver-flashing edge of the moon-swept sea on the horizon. Behind them the swale of plateau ran clear to the curtain of the woods. And then, he said, they decided to explore further. Again they entered the woods. This time a clump of trees guarded by a fringe of stunted, desolate-looking deadwood. And somehow the air felt different. There was a chill and dankness about it he had not noticed in the other woods. The girl shivered. Up a slight incline, and then into the open again, and on their right a dark mass, the gloomy pile of a deserted house, its empty windows black, leering dead eyes, and moonlight heaping fantastic shadows about its front, and through the ruins of what had once been a noble portachere. A bit of broken pane in one of the lower windows flickered eerily in the moon rays. The girl brought her animal close to his, her eyes shielded with one hand as she passed the house with averted head. "'What's the matter, dear?' he choked. "'Afraid that you will see the goblins holding carnival inside?' But she only cowered closer to the saddle. And that was so odd, so different from her usual bold demeanor, that it chilled him. And then something, vague, unformed, brushed between them. He felt it touch his boot, he said. The girl screamed, the horses plunged, and she wheeled her beast, crowding the man into the brush as she spurred past him. He followed only to see her throw her horse once more onto its haunches as she turned again, squarely in front of the house. And the thought passed through his mind of the house as a finite being, an unclean object squatting there inside its circle of blasted trees. He rode up beside her as she sat, with staring eyes and heaving breasts and to his question she answered simply, "'It is the end,' she said. And then her mood changed, and her lips sought his, and covered them with voluptuous kisses. "'Dismount,' she whispered. I could see the perspiration gathering on his forehead as he told this part, although his voice never changed. "'Dismount?' She coaxed again, her lips caressed his throat. Her arms were about him now as they pressed closely, the horses jammed against one another. "'We are going in there together, dear boy,' and the white teeth touched his flesh, and through him passed a wave of pure terror. "'I'm damned if we are,' he snapped, and tearing himself loose, snatched at her bridle and urged the horse into a gallop. He didn't remember how they got out, he said. The horses must have found the way. All he could remember was a rush through the restraining underbrush, the girl sobbing as they went, until at last they broke through to the high road and sanity. That night she told me her story, told him with his arms around her and he quivered now and then at the telling, 
and once, as a dog howled somewhere in the distance, he pushed her from him for a moment. She understood and laughed, though the tears were close beneath. She was twelve, she said, when the terror first came to her, in her home on the Nister, almost in the shadow of the Carpathians, a feudal hold whose foundations went back to time immemorial. One wing was forbidden territory, blocked off from the rest of the old castle it was, with its own tiny court, the only entrance a door giving from the east tower to the courtyard. The gatekeeper, Old Portal, was the only human she had ever seen go through its entrance. Playing with her jacks one afternoon, she found the courtyard door open, and with the curiosity of a child overcoming the strict injunction, had slipped in. It was late, and the rays of the setting sun were striking the massive tower door. Sitting on the lentil, she idly threw the jackstones against the oak. Deeper the shadows grew except for one bright spot at the height of a man's head, where the sunlight struck. Once again she carelessly tossed the jacks against the door. There was a rattle, and stir inside, and with a creaking groan the door swung inward, and the child found herself staring at something that lurked and mewed in the opaque shadow. Startled, she rose to her feet, and it rose too, and stood with head and shoulders framed in the light of the dying sun, gazing down on her. Terror froze the girl, for through the dusk she could see the body, the body of the thing that should not have been, and she cowered there. It bent toward her, and she felt herself picked up in arms that were not human crushing against a form not human, while the face that was human, but should not have been, blew its fetid breath upon her. In a voice rasping and metallic, like no human voice, it spoke, in a horrid, unforgettable monotone, that thrilled and bit deep into her brain. You have come to me of your own free will. You have called me. Again will I come to you, and yet again. And you shall belong to me, body and soul, to do my bidding for the ages and ages to come. One arm forced the girl's head back, passing over her neck a dreadful caress. The face bent over her throat, and slavering lips touched her skin. The pointed teeth pressed against her flesh. Came one shriek of terror from her, and then oblivion. She was sixteen when she met the terror again, riding through the woods near Gargenstein with her cousin Ivan, the pair of them madly in love. She had felt the icy blast of a wave of horror, and sensed the shadowy thing that loped on all fours by her stirrup, its hot breath on her boot, and the touch of fearsome lips on its leather. All that evening she had cowered in her room, gazing at the boot that lay where she had flung it, a broad white mark blasted on its shining surface. For she was certain then, she told him, that what they had said was a terrible dream four years ago had been no dream at all. Ivan, called to the colors the next day by the mobilization, lay, a few months later, a sprawling corpse in a blood-soaked morass of the Mersian Lake, she told him. Whether or not my friend ever saw the girl again, that I don't know. At any rate, he never mentioned the thing to me from that day until the night he died. So there the matter lies. 
I cannot give any explanation. Perhaps you can. But the howl of a dog at night annoys me. The End of The Edge of the Shadow by R. Ernest Depew.